So it's a complete honor to welcome Dr. Thomas Isaac. He does, doesn't need an introduction, uh, but for those who are our international participants, uh, perhaps he doesn't need an introduction also for the international crowd. But I'd just like to say that he was a uh, uh, finance minister in the previous uh, LDF government. And uh, people know him widely also as a pedagogue. And I think uh, that identity he wears with ease most of the time. And uh, one of the things I think that is uh, most inspiring for us in his political trajectory is the fact that he's a votary of self-determination and local autonomy. And I think that is what brings him here to this conference uh, today. Um, among the various public policy innovations ushered in by him uh, is one thing that's very memorable, which is the infrastructure investment board for public investment uh, that he thought out. And I think that is, uh, that is also extremely pertinent to this conference. So I welcome all of you to give him a round of applause to make him feel welcome. Thank so, you. So, yes. Um, I think I don't know how to hold the microphone, but it's, yeah. Uh, this is looking okay, Guru, no problem. Other mics? Um, yeah, no, no worries. I uh, just wanted to say that uh, Dr. Isaac has insisted that we keep this a free-flowing conversation. So perhaps after an initial round of discussions, it might even be wonderful if we have some questions from the audience, with your permission. Um, so I think it's most befitting in this conversation that Trevor is joining us on. Thank you, Trevor, for us to begin with that, those two magic words, it's called Kerala model, and to ask uh, Dr. Isaac, in the current context of the global knowledge economy, where do you see Kerala fit, and where do you see Kerala contribute? Well, that's a very long story. I just presented you with a book, with just show it up. It's about Kerala, another possible world. Another world is possible. So we are looking forward to building a possible world. That may not be the best, but what is possible within the limitations of today, which will inspire you to look forward to greater uh, visions in the future. Now, put it very simply, Kerala has been distinguished by its redistributive achievements. You know, in normal economic thinking, economic growth comes first. It will reach an inflection, inflection point. Till then, inequality will continue to increase. Kuzinets, Simon Kuzinets. And then, after some time, there will trickle down of benefits to everybody, individual to will decline. A uh, distinctive feature of Kerala development is that we intervene at the earliest stage of development, it's a growth itself, to redistribute. Through higher wages, three, through redistributional landed assets, and public provisioning of education and health care. So that people in the state, ordinary people in the state, enjoy uh, good education, health care, a better life. In the Human Development Index, Kerala would come to uh, upper middle income country status. Okay, that's what we achieved. And it's very creditable too. But now there are second generation challenges. Uh, now though we have only one child in a family, we want to give better education than the education that is being provided. You will live up to 80 and you have new diseases, lifestyle diseases, which requires a different intervention. Um, and because you have concentrated, focused upon social sectors, you have underinvested in infrastructure, and there's a terrible infrastructure deficit. 
unless and until that is uh, overcome uh, it will be difficult to catch up with the growth that is taking place in the rest of india and the educated are not satisfied with the traditional jobs they want uh, quality jobs which pay them very well and that we are not able to provide so politically we are facing a big challenge some people are saying you are very good at redistributing you have distributed the cake very well but now we have to cake new ones before you can redistribute for which you have no agenda so this is the challenge that is being faced and so a strategy is drawn up uh, through off budget borrowing investing in infrastructure then leveraging that to transform the economy into a knowledge economy which would imply total transformation or upgradation of the technological base of the existing industries and the future industries that would be coming so that the economy moves from a low productivity regime to high productivity regime and in this transition we find the digitalization and the cooperative platforms would play a very very important role and that's the reason we look forward to your discussions here and learn from the discussions so this is the stage that we are uh, just as a follow up question sir um, in the age of swiggy zomato amazon and everything going online is there a possibility to envision all of this in the same spirit of creating social value and public value through digitalization not same spirit different spirit <laughs> same uh, what traditional tries to reap economy so scale by concentrating production one place now with the digital advancement is possible to decentralize production but yet interconnect all these production units so that you still take advantage of the economies of scale now the challenge is how to overcome the monopoly control of this network networking of production units so that it become doesn't become another exploitative instrument to exploit the small production units and that's where publicly controlled or cooperatively controlled platforms becomes very very important this so this is not the same spirit a different spirit so you can have a production system for example let's put the theme of uh, the present conference also includes feminist economy now in kerala we are very proud of everything but uh, there is nothing to be very much proud about status of women in kerala the conditions definitely in terms of education healthcare and so on and so forth are definitely far above the rest of india but when you begin to measure the status of women vis-a-vis men well there is no difference between kerala and other states now this is a very complex issue that cannot be resolved in simple formula but an important compo- con- uh, contribution contributory factor has been the fact that women have been marginalized in the economic growth process not the development process yes they have been educated care etc but pure economic growth process they have been marginalized their participation rate in kerala though they are equally or better educated than men their participation rate is half the of male okay a simple shortcut to ensure the kerala grows fast and productivity in the economy improves would be to bring this women into the labor force not in some low productivity jobs and so on, 
they are all educated women who have broken their career because of family commitments or just withdrew from uh, the labor force because of discouraging effect. See, unemployment rate among women is three times that of men. And therefore, after some time, <clears throat> even just withdraw into the house, go out of the, opt out of the labor force. Suppose we are able to raise the labor participation of women, that too, in a productive manner, equivalent to men, and that would be a big transformation for Kerala. Economy, how do you do it? One limitation is that, well, that work will have to be remunerative, transparent, but we cannot ignore the fact that they will not be able to leave the house completely, go away somewhere. So they will have to work from home or preferably work lodges in the neighborhood. Now, they are educated. Can you skill them in digital techniques or others so that they are able to make take advantage of the employment possibilities that are in the global economy or in the national economy. Now it will have to be customized training, not some general training. Suppose we are able to map the demand for skills, employment, then you customize the training program here. So this will require creation of an elaborate platform where employers and the workers can meet who are now skilled. They are placed on a platform. Government guarantees that they are this minimum capabilities. But the problem is that gig economy, the exploitation in terms of social security and so on. So it's here the role of government comes. Government will guarantee that these people will be provided with social security. That's the incentive for global employers to come to Kerala, to come, pay decent wages, because there's an intermediation of the government. It's not a platform created by somebody and being managed. It's the government that is intermediating the interface between uh, the workers, potential workers and the employers, guaranteeing decent jobs. And the government would also provide upskilling so that there is a social mobility, upward mobility for them and would provide from government funds as an incentive that they would give them social security. <clears throat> now, this platform now will cease to be a platform which controlled by somebody which takes a commission on the employment that is given. It's very different. Uh, it's, uh, this is what we aspire to. You have Uni Krishna here who has been working, but my criticism against him is that customized training is not taking place. We are just placing the trained persons who have whatever skills on a platform. No. Uh, there has to be a continuous conversation to go on with the employers in here, not only for wage work, but also for enterprises to be set up in Kerala. So this is the idea. So in this new Kerala knowledge economy, one important component is killing women at home, working at home, so that their work becomes transparent and they're remunerated, even social security and platform would play a very, very important role. Am I right, Uni? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> He's the boss here. <laughs> uh, so, so in 2019, uh, you invited me to address uh, the Legislative Assembly here which um, I think uh, showed that there's some openness, right, to, I guess, global influences, as Kerala is famous for. And uh, so I guess we, you know, are really delighted to have you here and welcome you at Roots of Resilience, which really focuses on bringing cooperative principles to the digital economy, right? 
But uh, so what we have found uh, working with collectives uh, in so many countries is that it's really hard to build this digital infrastructure. And that while, of course, the uh, local economy, as you pointed out, is so important, right? We often found that there's a need for federation and replication of models that exist in other countries already to use their digital infrastructure. And I wonder how that fits into your uh, thinking that is uh, so much uh, anchored right, in, in Kerala and in the local economy. So what role can those digital federations play in bringing infrastructure to be reused uh, in Kerala? Oh, very much. I think um, we met with each other at the legislative complex for the first time when I was a minister and we went there. And also second time I came to meet you in the hotel yeah. with the Sonia. Okay. Yeah, we came to the to meet you. Um, then this knowledge economy concept had not fully crystallized. Mm -hmm. We were playing around with that theme. Uh, it was in fact at that time we met. <laughs> I was preparing for the budget and uh, this I knew was going to be an important uh, now, this is not uh, inventing something from Tabula Rasa, but uh, no. Um, I think Kalavala could learn from what's happening all over the globe. Because, you know, we are in very difficult global situation. Um, at one time in the past, things seemed so simple our transition to a better world, etc. Now it has become much more complex. You don't know, you are no surety how exactly it's going to take place, how world change is going to come. But, you know, one thing is for sure, for example, new, new digital technologies that we are talking, including AI, etc., cannot be accommodated in the present uh, relations of production. Mm -hmm. What is the impact of this new technology on employment? Mm -hmm. Serious concern is that a uh, lot of people will be thrown out of employment. Mm -hmm. But why should they? You just reduce the number of days of labor. Mm -hmm. uh, from five to four, and that's the answer. But that answer cannot be given by the present system of production. And that's where you feel that the present is pregnant with the possibilities of big change. And we, though we are not clear how Excel is going to work out, but making the new world is not something that you begin after the old is gone and destroyed. This is something that you live today. The sprout of the new takes place in the old. And therefore, all the little and big experiments that are going all over the globe, not by somebody, everybody, experimenting for a new future, um, holds out a lot of promise, in fact, lessons. And that's how that will determine what will be the future. And therefore, um, definitely in Kerala, we would uh, learn, profit from experiments that happen all over. And I think uh, that was the spirit in which we had discussed in the room, but I didn't follow it up there for many other reasons. Nothing to do between us, but just. But <laughs> I didn't yield to your persuasions. But with that be, it is not an isolation. We have to learn from each other. I guess just following up on one, one thing, I think one uh, wonderful thing, I think, and the reason that we are in Kerala together here is that there is so much support, right, from 
the state government uh, for cooperatives, that there's this grassroots movement, also as you describe in your book, right, Building Alternatives, how uh, there's this grassroots movement which also allowed for ULCCS to emerge, for Kudumbashwi to thrive, right? Um, so, but how do you see the role of the state, right, in relation to those cooperatives? Because sometimes, uh, and, and you pointed this out in your introduction to my talk last time, where you said basically you see them as an initial supporter, right? You see them as that's providing startup funding and, and legislative support, but then they need to be let go. Did I understand that correctly? Or is, has your position changed on that? I'm going to add to that. Or jump in. If and that's it may a be a question uh, which can answer several PhD theses at once. So uh, the question is this, that we are at a, a certain conjuncture where enabling conditions for uh, the transition of cooperative institutions in society have become even more vital because they're all disempowered by the assault of a certain form of global economy for decades. Secondarily, but also equally importantly, is the question of reining in the monopoly cooperation, which for a state like Kerala is perhaps a new pathway. It's in my view, and because you encouraged me, sir, to also be argumentative at our coffee, I'm just going to ask you, <laughs> the issue is not only for the state to provide social security and subsidize cooperative enterprises. The issue is to take a strong stance against the big guys who are transnational and wearing the robes and costumes that make them seem in a way like they are highly localized, but they are not. They're actually hollowing out the local economy. So in that regard, it is the central government that has called the shots for a very long time. But as we reach a decentralization era of the digital, the state, the subnational units, the local government has to rein in the big corporation. So I'd like you to address both, you know, both feet, the enabling environment and reining in the big corporation yeah. in the same breath, so many of us can write our PhD thesis. Okay, okay. This question is Thank you, uh, <laughs> tricky one. <laughs> and yours is tricky. In fact, it was search for this answer to this question that, um, um, in fact, uh, pushed me to write two books, case studies. One has been on Dinesh Pidi, published by Cornell University. Other on ULCCS. We are having a meeting at the premises. Uh, yeah. It's here. Uh, democracy at work, first one. And this one is building alternatives. Um, see, the mainstream theory does not accept that cooperatives can work. One, you need capital to start a firm. And more modern the firm, greater the capital requirement the workers cannot mobilize that much money. Very well, we have a state and institutions which can support, you can mobilize the money. But then, let's say it cannot be efficiently run for two reasons. One is normal capitalist firm is profit maximizing firm. Therefore, simple, straightforward, efficiency, efficiency measurement and so on. But here you have multiple objectives. It's not just profit alone, welfare of the worker, happiness of the worker, what or not. So how do you calculate all this? You need a very complex calculation to measure uh, efficiency. That's why. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the management. Who is the boss? The worker or the manager? The manager is selected by the worker and therefore manager will find it difficult to manage the worker. That's the simple thing. I remember RP had this uh, um, article long time back when I was a student. Um, what do bosses do? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
So, uh, that's the second. Okay, you get over that some way. Then the most important question, why should and how can a cooperative accumulate? Because the workers who are the owners would like to have the surplus distributed among themselves. If they invest, when they retire, they can take a piece of the cooperative and go home. So, why should they allow accumulation at all? And finally, mainstream economics says, all right, you have made profit, you accumulated, then you will cease to be a cooperative. The existing members will become bosses and hire people and so on. So, this, this cooperative success of cooperative will self-destruct, okay. This is the thinking, like mainstream economic thinking. So, it just answers precisely these questions. I took two successful, most successful cooperatives in Kerala. One is Kerala Dinesh BD Cooperative and other is uh, ULCCS, CS, and analyze these questions. But I'll stick to accumulation. That was your question. One, what do the worker want? Worker wants a steady improvement in the real wages, real labor conditions. He is not thinking what is the total surplus, how can he catch up everything? No. He is focused upon real, real labor, condi labor conditions, real increase over time. Not in nominal terms, real increase in labor conditions. So you assure that. Then there is still surplus level. How can that be accumulated? There are three elements who would enable that would enable that. One is theory and the ideology itself. The worker should learn that the entire value is not created by him in that factory. Mm -hmm. It is created by the worker who made the means of production, who made the raw material, and therefore the surplus belongs to the working class. Okay, this is a little abstract thing, but a little bit of politics is very important. Uh, yeah, the capitalism makes workers uh, inanimate objects of uh, market. But in a socialist society, real socialist society, or an alternative society, each individual should be taking, thinking, and articulating his request. Therefore, we should teach them. Second, it is easier to convince them. The firm must grow so that it faces competition. His job is to be secured. Two, his children, their employment, they are educated, they have to move on. ULCCS, this was explicitly general body decision. You see, our children need better jobs than construction. And therefore, that's why they decided to diversify into electronics. Yeah, it's a general body decision. Uh, discussed and decided by every worker. And uh, finally, history and pride in the society. Mm -hmm. See, it's not dropped from heavens here. Society has organically grown, is embedded in the society. That, that the political society in which it is embedded is very important. And therefore, you will find Little bit of managerial things. ULCCS, it is all right. You borrow and invest, and repayment and interest, etc., comes from the normal income, and therefore there is no fight over that. <laughs> the surplus would be a minus of this uh, repayment schedules and so on. In Dinesh PD, they have a system of profit calculation is made at the central level, at the federating units, they have a different managerial system where um, only what is required for payment, etc., is given. So with certain managerial methodology, 
it should be possible to accumulate. And here are two cases where to such freedom, there are so many. But then the last question is the politically uh, bombshell, will it remain a cooperative? <laughs> <laughs> so you had, for example, ULCCS, uh, where, okay, the Kerala workers don't want, members don't want to work in the construction industry anymore. Mm -hmm. It's all done by people who are migrant workers yeah. who come. Um, new generation doesn't want, they would prefer in some other occupation in the cooperative so this cooperative, will it degenerate into being an employer of migrant workers? By the way, Montagon, there is a whole criticism All about right. this. Okay, I don't want to, I don't agree with that. But still, this is one whole radical stream that has been criticizing Montagon experience. So, there's a lot of debate. And finally, I'm very proud of the decision. They decided that migrant workers are temporary workers, but they will be given membership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that C-class membership category, they would get equal benefits mm -hmm. as food members. Members are privileged to get certain benefits. Yeah. So, so I, I see, so that, that degeneration hypothesis is prevented, you see, mm -hmm. prevented. Um, so these are, mm, um, Ways. See, okay, you are cooperative, the issues are not solved. As you grow, challenges will come and they will be addressed. And one question is in capitalist economy, greater the firm, greater the competitive power, and therefore the profit and so on. So even if production is small scale, now platform economy allows them to have aggregated at national and global scale and reap big profits. Mm -hmm. And in Kerala, Anita, you were saying you were taking decentralization, local governments and so on. So how are we going to link these two cooperatives? Are you going to go into larger and larger cooperatives um, mm -hmm. into national level or global level and so on? Well, I think main trend has been linking the cooperatives with the local governments. Mm -hmm. It has not been very successful. It's not something very terribly new. I mean, you see, it was Nehru, in fact. Mm -hmm. I always quote Nehru on this. He said, the formula for local level development is one, the school, mm -hmm. two, panchayat, local government, three, local corporate. These link together giving local development. Mm -hmm. So linking cooperative with the local development is very important. And therefore, even this platform economy, say consumer, uh, say uh, product distribution, marketing. Now you think of Amazon, you think of big thing, therefore you think of all Kerala by food chain, which will be given alternative to that. Why should it be? You can have an efficient platform at the local level so that local product is sold in the local market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, this is one thing, a greatest experience in decentralized planning. It was innovated by one of the panchayats in Truandro. <clears throat> so, they had a labor bank which would lend labor to anybody any farmer who wanted to cultivate it or something. Money need to be given only when the crop is taken. Now, how do then the workers have uh, the, the subsistence? The local cooperative gives them an overdraft, which will have to be repaid either by the panchayat guarantee. Or this. Mm -hmm. So, what do the panchayat do? Panchayat gives the workers' coupons and the, the village stores accept the coupons. Mm -hmm. Now, the stores 
buy the products to sell to the workers etc from the local kudumbasri then kudumbasri was not born in but the local self help groups now this panchayat was inviting a local money here what is money money is nothing but a piece of paper or a token which is accepted by everybody so because after some time people did not rush okay collect the money the trader doesn't come to the panchayat he continues to pay to the uh, the, the self help group uh, they would buy, again buy from the shop because they are sure the panchayat would pay or the bank would pay fine see this is the multiplier impact of a little investment made is linked to the local development uh, this i think is a yeah. best example innovative aspect example of yeah. then platform digital platform economy had not taken birth it was 1997 <laughs> so <laughs> it is not birth but today this becomes big easy when you have a local digital platform i am involved in a experiment in um, patrandata adur municipality faisal panchayat where is very interesting there are about 30 40 micro enterprises producing all sorts of powders and pickles and so each one in its own way so we want to standardize that but don't want to bring them all into one shop one floor to work what is the best way to standardize they ensure they use the best and uniform raw material for this so cooperative will lend them this okay through whatsapp system they would deliver to the people when they order so they have wholesale sources from say outside kerala wherever this cheap provided so standardized production takes place in terms of quality of thing now there is a platform at the panchayat level where anybody can whatsapp and say we want this a home shopper in every uh, every ward based upon this is this is delivered to the house who will take it to the to the households see is a perfect way a digital platform local economy is built up now you can have the same thing running all kerala but i tell you it will charge you 30% here any platform they cannot run without 30% which platform i am i am working with somebody who wants to have 30% the government is working with that but here 30% in notary i will give that 30% maybe 10% for uh, management team 20% will go to the poor woman who is taking all these things to the household so this is the way the digital economy the digital platform is customized to requirement of the locality i can give any number of instances i'll tell you one more and stop i met a techie from dubai who came back to palakkad so i heard he was doing all of uh, crazy things so i man so he has a uh, high six uh, acre land a very interesting integrator farming thing he managed six seven farmers okay and then they began to supply milk for 60 70 families now advantage of ordering milk from the mills they can choose which cows milk they want all these six farmers the cows uh, uh, pictures have been uploaded in whatsapp in the in the in the what not even whatsapp instagram they put the cow so they can take a photograph of this cow we want so you'll be delivered that cow's milk is as if you are growing a cow in your house here that's an advantage <laughs> you get the same milk every day not uh, 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 uniformized and uh, kind of milk that you get from the so that's it now next innovation is the bigger so there are two three young fellows who take milk to these 65 houses which are contracted by with these five farmers then they started every day in the evening or afternoon they would send a whatsapp message say these are the vegetables available in our farm so you want it 
you send back your WhatsApp. There's no digital symbol thing, WhatsApp, this and that. And when the milk is taken next day, fresh vegetables are plucked in the night, packed, and you get some fresh, most fresh, not even one day, one day fresh vegetables in your house here. Now, this is a perfect example of few people, eh? six farmers, uh, cooperating with, uh, is a, uh, creating a WhatsApp group of their selling product. And I, I think it's an innovation here. And all their vegetables are sold. There's nothing to be sold out, say. They have from started fish also. <laughs> you tell they will supply fish along with the milk in the morning. The transportation cost is minimized because everything is delivered by this boy who go. So these are the ways, Sanita. You asked, uh, that is very good, prompted me to say all these anecdotes. <laughs> you see, these are not given by somebody, you know, somebody, bright guy giving the thing. People innovate here. Yeah. Just to it's maybe really bring it back to the beginning with Anita's intervention. Uh, oh, so, okay. Well, maybe that's, that's, that would be nice to hear, to come back maybe to the beginning and see uh, what Kerala, if there are initiatives in, in Kerala that push back a little bit against this power of these big tech companies to give some breathing room to these alternatives, right? Because it's obviously not a fair competition, right? So what legislators can do is to uh, at least enforce the existing laws to give some more space for alternatives to grow, to give parity to digital platforms that are run cooperatively, uh, to those that are run as venture capitalist uh, firms. No? Too difficult? Is that... Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Not, not yes. to talk of startup funding, but um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe this is too... No, no. Another was uh, telling me yesterday somebody's presentation. Uh, one limitation they face is they don't have the roof maps from the entire city, detailed. And now, why should it be a proprietary knowledge? Why should it be that knowledge be in the commons that everybody can use? Cannot the state legislate? And if they refuse, why can't a set of people sit down and do it? Challenge them. And that's where the open source uh, or uh, free software movements so become very relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, so state has a role to facilitate this transition. Mm -hmm. By tweaking the laws, you can't change. There is a WTO over the, the this national framework for all this, etc. Mm -hmm. But anything can be changed by a team of people who are committed to this. Okay, mm -hmm. And um, maybe even call for a boycott here, yeah, unless they provides you, provides this data information of the common thing, we will boycott you. Now, he demands a kind of political uh, thinking of a different higher level. But I agree with you. State will have to play an important role in facilitating this. A new liberal state is not the old state or lace affair of locked time. Mm -hmm. That time, the state is uh, withdrawing. But neoliberal state is a state which intervenes to privatize everything, create uh, advantages, terms for the, um, the cronies and so on. So you also need maybe a regional state, national state is very difficult, a regional state or local state which will intervene for creating an alternative. Mm -hmm. It's hard to have a last word after that. But I think uh, maybe if I can, Guru, uh, take five minutes just to have two questions. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for those remarks. I'm Sabina Dewan with the Just Jobs Network. Uh, I particularly wanted to thank you for uh, talking about women. And, and to quote you, women have been marginalized in the growth process, though not in the development process. And making that distinction is fundamentally important, and not something we all do. All right. Yeah, that yeah. women have been marginalized in the growth process, talk. though not in the development process. So I appreciate that distinction that's not often made. 
my question relates to that, which is how do you define the knowledge economy? Because if we're talking about structural transformation and the shift from low productivity to high productivity, moving women into the platform economy where many of them have PhDs but are still doing kind of tagging work isn't exactly a knowledge economy. So I'm, I'm curious about how you would define the knowledge economy and how do we get there? Okay. Thank you. In my presentation, initial presentation I used as an acronym for the change I wanted in Kerala. <laughs> okay, let me put it that way. But see, any production, any production, any time requires knowledge, either traditional or learned, it, it's knowledge that's required. But now you have reached a stage in human development where knowledge itself is becoming almost a, almost a direct uh, uh, productive uh, force. See, genetics is the sheer knowledge of uh, the, the cell, the genetic um, structure that has become uh, the productive force. You see. Knowledge is increasingly becoming the productive force. That is forcing the, mono, the private monopolies and so on to monopolize knowledge itself, all patent system, everything that has come. But this is where the world is heading. So Kerala should accelerate the move to that, take full advantage of this. In a manner, it does not destroy, I mean, increase the everybody it's inclusive everybody benefits there is no digital divide okay to start with and therefore the moment this was conceived first thing that was done school digitalization which i think is best in the country here you start a k phone probably having free internet to everybody a lot of people have been asking me geo is going to provide to every household where do you want to duplicate no one, one, one don't want to be some private monopoly to challenge this, if take control over this basic uh, networking thing. And you ensure the BPL people, poor people get it free as their right. Okay, um, COVID time we have promised everybody a laptop also, the school children. Um, government of India is permitting to borrow. So a lot of people were not borrowing. We borrowed to the hilt and <laughs> unfortunately Chinese supply chain uh, was not restored and we couldn't get the laptop. Now economic situation has changed. Okay, this has done, it's not a half a sudden, it's a conscious move to ensure there is no digital divide, you see. And then regarding the creation of the platform, see, government intermediation so that exploitation is reduced, their rights are guaranteed. So this knowledge economy, we want to be slightly different, economic, totally different, but different. And I thought at that time that uh, Kerala's brand image is good, you know, with COVID victory and so on. So at that three years back, it looked an opportune moment to move it and uh, take advantage of this good brand name. Um, but things have not moved that fast as we wanted. But this is the concept. Um, I think we're running out of time. So I would uh, request you, uh, Dr. Isaac, to stay with us so that you could also interact with some of us at lunch. We will have a closing assembly now, and we will have the Tiruvananthapuram Declaration coming out of this conference. But before that, we had three interesting community labs over the past two days. And even prior to the conference, members of this lab who have come together from the entire country and from Kerala have been debating three extremely important topics. One is about rebooting older cooperatives to be ready for the digital future. The second community lab has been talking about what, is, what does it take to make technology part of the commons? And what is that kind of regime? Beginning, of course, with the free software and open software movement, but going forward into new ideas like open data, open protocols, et cetera. That was the second community lab. 
And the third community lab was about worker rights and decent work uh, and to completely annihilate the gig economy. So the reports from these labs are going to be here with us just now, immediately after the session. I would like to request you to please stay with us and join us for lunch yeah. and take some time to enjoy the conference.